You are listening to the third broadcast of TBR Radio Presents, TBR History Hour. Hosted by Dr. Edward DeVries. TBR Contributing Editor. The TBR History Hour is a weekly audio journal of politically incorrect history. In today's broadcast Dr. Ed interviews TBR's Executive Editor Paul Angel to discuss the January-February issue of the Barnes Review magazine. Hopefully you're going to notice that the audio, at least the audio on my end, is much clearer in today's broadcast than it has been in previous broadcasts. And the reason for that is because of a new microphone that we're using. It's called a Blue Microphone. It's designed specifically for radio and podcasting. It's an external microphone that plugs into your computer. It uses a USB port. It's a nifty little device here. Uh, previously, we were using a, uh, a golden microphone. In fact, here a few years ago, when I first started here on TBR Radio, I remember emailing Rush Limbaugh and asking him, I said, hey, Rush, where do I get one of those golden EIB microphones that you talk so much about? And he emailed me back, and he said, you can buy them on eBay. And so I looked, and sure enough, they were about 12 bucks. If I uh, wanted to, I guess I could have paid about 30 bucks and bought one from an American vendor, or I could wait about three weeks and get one from China for about 12. And that microphone worked great until Catalina, the update for the Mac operating system. And for whatever reason, Catalina did not like those microphones. I have had one. I'd also gotten one for my son who was using it for some of his podcasting and uh, some of the YouTube videos and some of the other things that he does uh, with uh, Fortnite instruction and so forth. And he's using it on a PC and it worked fine. But for some reason, those microphones did not want to work on Mac after the Catalina update. And so we were having some production issues and we did the first few broadcasts using of this show. And then, of course, the last few broadcasts of the year for our other shows, we did them with a uh, the microphone built into the iMac. And the sound quality was just horrendous. And so for Christmas, my son bought me this blue microphone, and let me tell you, it is just doing a beautiful job. So if you're thinking, I sound so good, it's because of the microphone. Of course, our guests were still uh, making phone calls and the audio staying the same there, but our in-studio sound quality is just tremendous. So I want to do a little shout out here to my son. Thank you, Will. Do a little shout out here to the Blue Microphone Company. You make a great and excellent product. Well, as is our custom on TBR Radio, the first uh, uh, broadcast of the month when a new issue of TBR Magazine, the Barnes Review Magazine, comes out, we have a conversation with Paul Angel, the executive editor of TBR Magazine. Uh, There was a little bit of a delay in the production of the magazine uh, because of the New Year and Christmas printers. The companies that actually print the magazine, they actually print the ink on the paper of course, they uh, they get backlogged that time of year. And so it creates a delay not only for the Barnes Review, but for other major publications as well. And then, of course, we had another uh, issue, and that was my personal production. Because as some of our listeners know, I'm in the process of moving the studio uh, from Florida to Maryland. And so there's another issue there. And the back and forth right now, hopefully we'll have that settled here in the next few weeks. But anyways... So excited to be back for the third week of the TBR History Hour, and I'm still just excited about this show and looking forward to seeing uh, the great things that we're going to discuss through the course of the year 2020. And one of those is today's conversation with Paul Angel as we begin discussing the January-February issue recently released of the Barnes Review magazine. Take a fast look at this issue. Well, how about if we start with the cover? Let's start with Buffalo Bill. I'm not exactly sure what I would say about Buffalo Bill here. What are we going to? You know, one thing that impressed me about that Buffalo Bill article, you know, the title was Buffalo Bill was the real deal. Um, We always, you know, think of Buffalo Bill as is just one of those, you know, blowhards of history, if you will. Right. And you know, Thomas Goodrich basically uh, goes through Buffalo Bill's life, and while he shows there was a lot of uh, bragging and there was a lot of BS. You know, in a lot of ways, he lived up to the legend. I mean, you know, there were, uh, you know, there were whole regiments of soldiers who, you know, basically entrusted him with their lives and and said that he was the best scout out on the plains. 
Yeah. And and so, you know, at least some of the legend was was based in fact and at the end of the day, even, you know, with all the BS aside and all the bragging and all the all the legend aside, uh, you know, there was still a hero there. There was still you know, a there real was man. still a man who, who had killed the buffalo and who had led the armies and who had uh you know, who who could do all of the things he exhibited in his Wild West show and had done them at one time in his life, you know, even if 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 he, you know, wasn't everything that the legend, you know, had said he was, he was still he was still more of a man than 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 most. As far as the cowboy goes, the uh, it was a fluffy story. The point there being that it wasn't. It, it I'm not sure that cowboy movies really ever portray them any differently. It was a tough life, right? And they were so they better be ready for trouble at any particular point in time. It certainly isn't a job that many people would be able to do today. Well, the first thing in this issue that struck my attention was John Friend's editorial that it's not okay to be white or that it is okay to be white. He titled it, Who Says It's Not Okay to Be White? Yes. Um, well, this is all generated from uh, the recent <clears throat> campaign to counter anti-white propaganda that's going on. Uh, uh, as an aside, I, I know somebody uh, in the State Department who was uh, uh, a security uh, a bodyguard, we'll say, for uh, some well-known uh, uh, figures in politics. I won't say who, but he we had a chance to get together over New Year's, and he wanted to let me know that that the FBI, and he sits on these meetings, the FBI believes 100% that the greatest threat, internal domestic terror, mass shootings, is white supremacism, plain and simple. Of course, I was, my jaw dropped because we know that uh, from one of our previous editorials that um, uh, the number of shootings is not being, the mass number of shootings, 95% are not being carried out by white people. There's an occasional psychotic one who shows up and might unload, uh, kill, kill 20, 30 people, which is a tragedy we all know. But when you compare the numbers, your chances of being killed by a, a white man are slim in that case. As a matter of fact, I think the statistics show that a white man is more likely to commit suicide with a gun than he has to shoot somebody else. That being said, um, this uh, to counter this, people were putting up signs that simply said, it's okay to be white. Um, now, we saw the minute these were put up, and one particular man was hunted down, hate crime. It was called, who put these up? This is terrible. Uh, who would dare put up something that said it's okay to be white? And he was, I think, kicked out of school, and they were going to bring him up on hate crimes charges and all this other stuff. Anti-Defamation League jumped in, and how racist supremacism that was to put up a sign that said it's okay to be white. So obviously what they're saying is it's not okay to be white. Now, that's a pretty bold statement to, to say to the majority population in the United States, but it's all part of the, the guilt trip that these groups want to lay on um, a, a white people. By the way, I just want to point out that uh, John Friend um, agreed. John Friend uh, is one of our uh, contributing editors. He submits stories and, and talks to us about stories and such. He's a young man based in California, extremely intelligent, and also um, uh, very industrious and also very opinionated, which is great because he's very literate and uh, he has a website and he'd been fired from his job in California for his personal and private posts on his own website in regard to the Holocaust. He has some uh, questions about some of the data and wants to know why we can't talk about it. The usual thing that is just ridiculous that that particular subject has been banned for talk. So he agreed to step in for the simple reason that my editor, John Tiffany, uh, has had a really bad fall and broke his hip in two places in his back. So I just wanted to send some thanks out there to John Friend for stepping in here and working with us and trying to edit some stories and work with me to write captions and uh, improve stories, et cetera, et cetera. You know how that is. So that fact of the matter was he's, he's given us this guest editorial. And he, he makes a very good point. I mean, we're living in a world of fantasy right now. You're looking at many things going on in the news and uh, the impeachment, for instance, of Trump uh, is for totally the wrong reasons. If you're going to impeach him, <laughs> impeach him for getting us in foreign wars. That's the real reason, unnecessary foreign wars. That's the real reason presidents should be impeached. But things have become so partisan here in D.C. No, uh, you know, everybody's scared to, to speak, to speak up. 
and uh, tell the truth. So part of the fantasy world here is that whites are genetically racist, that whites are discriminatory, that whites are the worst, the worst. Oh, of course, white supremacism must be um, also responsible for these attacks on the city community, which are uh, an explosion of anti-Semitism, they tell us in the news, and what you find out is that, for the most part, what's going on is not white supremacists attacking Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn, specifically, I think a great number of the you know, alleged hate crimes um, uh, happening now are in uh, New York, and specifically in Brooklyn, where it's black people who were and they're not, and they're not, well, there was an incident in a deli, and there was an incident where a man had to come into a Hanukkah celebration, or a Passover celebration, I guess it was, and slashed the rabbi or something. And four or five people were injured, and one rabbi was hurt pretty bad. But um, I don't think he's going to die, but he might not be able to speak or walk or something like that. But the point being that that's certainly not white supremacism. And so we're being led to believe that now blacks are super racist, and they're just attacking Jews in the Hasidic Jewish community in particular because they hate Jews and they're anti-Semitic. Well, then you start to interview the blacks on the streets down there and you find out that they're really riled up because the Hasidic Jewish community, when it comes in, will bring their own people in. They will uh, 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 gentrify the place, we'll say, or make things more expensive. They're buying up the local shops. The prices are being driven up for poor blacks who live in the area or are trying to survive. Jobs are being taken up. And then these Hasidic Jews will also run for the school board. And all of a sudden, the, they're uh, sending more money to their yeshivas, I guess it is, than they are for the black and Latino community. But it was amazing the number of people, just average black people in the streets of Brooklyn, who were uh, who told the truth of what they saw was happening. They certainly weren't worried about white supremacism. They were worried about Jewish supremacism in their neighborhoods. One of the other things they were alleging was that since most of these Hasidic Orthodox Jews are married off the books, and then the wife looks like she's single, even though we've got four or five kids, they're able to provide for welfare. The young Jewish men aren't working. Hasidic men aren't working. They are studying the Talmud, and uh, they are then collecting welfare themselves. And so they're just running the same gimmick that they've run many, many times, and they're fed up with it. Now, violence, as you well know, is not a solution that we adopt at the Barnes Review. But listening to the level of anger that was going on in the black community, you have to wonder exactly uh, what's going on, whether it's anti-Semitism or whether they're just irritated that their neighborhoods are being stolen from them. Uh, that then... Of course, what we hear, and I, this friend I was mentioning said, I said, this is a bunch of baloney about white supremacism. This is not what the FBI needs to be worrying about. They need to be worrying about telling the truth when they go before Congress, not lying 17 times about the president, et cetera, et cetera. And he immediately said, well, look, here's what I'm talking about. See, this is a white supremacist attacked a Hasidic family. And I said, he got that a little mixed up. And I said in the picture of the deranged black man, uh, I don't think he was uh, mentally stable. And I said, another white supremacist strikes. But it was, a, yet again, a, a black attack on the Hasidics. So I don't know what to tell you about that, um, except to say that it is okay to be white. Just like he says, John says, can be black, Asian, Latino, Jewish, American Indian, Aboriginal, Australian, or pygmy, whatever race you are, it's okay to have pride in your own people. As a matter of fact, that's the essence of ethnic nationalism. And um, it's also it, it, when, you, when you understand that the goal is first to lift up your own communities and together we move forward as a nation, then that's the way to do it. But this, this, this blaming and these guilt trips and these lies is absolutely ridiculous. There's just so much of it going on. I don't want to get off the track too much. But as I was sitting, I took my son to a dental appointment this morning to have his teeth cleaned. And I picked up Time. And, of course, as you know by now, uh, Time magazine has made Greta Thunberg their, uh, their person of the year. She's that young Swedish right activist who's a climate change person. This is all part of my point that we're living in a fantasy narrative uh, top to bottom. And, of course, she's worried and blames it all on us, you know, this, this generation. And uh, we've, we've created this problem. Of course, I just saw the Glacier National Park has been forced to remove their sign that was up that said, uh, your gla these glaciers will be gone by 2020. Well, they've pulled that sign down because the glaciers are actually expanding, not receding. So it's just another part of this, and I'm looking at Thunberg, and she said it's all our fault. Our generation did this. Of course, all our generation did was fight a few wars to protect America, lay 586,000 guys, got wounded and killed in World War II. You know, whether it was a right war or the wrong war, they went off to fought, and they fought the best they could, and they came back. They were sent off to Korea to do what they had to do. Shouldn't have been there. We know that. And I thought, wait a second now. Greta Thunberg, 
She's from the generation that, A, can't go to school, at least in America, if the air conditioning's not working. Every classroom has to have an air conditioner. Now, you're probably from a generation like I was, at least, that if it was really, really hot, we opened the window, put a fan on in school. We didn't yeah, have exactly. air conditioning. Right, right. Our gym so wasn't air conditioned up. or heated, and so we baked or froze every time we, you know, played basketball or whatever. But, uh, but not this generation. They want to suck up every bit of energy they can. Now, of course, this is the only generation, as one man said in Australia, that uh, the kids don't really walk to school or ride their bikes to school. They, they arrive in caravans of personally delivered cars, right, burning up more gasoline, more hydrocarbons or whatever they're claiming is going on. They're also the first generation that doesn't walk outside to get their entertainment and run around and kick a ball around or, or throw a ball through a hoop. Now they're sitting on their electronic devices all day long, all day long, maybe all night long, too, sucking at more energy. And of course, they're the first generation that has demanded that we open our arms and our hearts to unlimited mass immigration, which means we got to cut down more forests and clear more land to put more housing up to support more people. You know what I mean? It's all a big fraud. Part of this big fraud of course, this is impeachment. As I said, if you're going to impeach Trump, impeach him for whatever crimes he's really done. Don't impeach him for, for looking for dirt on, on, on the Bidens, uh, which is very justifiable considering what we're now finding out uh, in Hunter Biden's. I'm way off track, but we'll keep going. Hunter Biden's, um, uh, you know, his paternity suit, right, that he had the affair with the stripper. This was after he divorced his wife so he could date his dead brother's wife and then broke up with her then he gets a stripper pregnant well anyway she wants some money and he says he hadn't got any money he didn't want to release all these documents and it turns out that these documents once they're released uh will prove that he was heavily involved in ukrainian corruption and that he and his dad both knew about it and guess whose name comes up in there again the name of crowdstrike exactly the company that trump mentioned in the first line of his communications with um uh, the ukrainian president he wanted to know CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike was involved in massive money laundering. Okay, once again, we're going after the president for this minor stuff. And here we have uh, other politicians on the other side. And let's face it, the Republicans too. But in this particular case, it's the Democrats who are throwing all the mud. who are much more corrupt, much more corruption involved. And also, that name CrowdStrike should ring a bell with people because that is the company that the Democrats hired to investigate who hacked the DNC servers. So Ukraine is very interesting. A lot of corruption going on there, and the Biden seem to have known a lot about it. But of course, once again, we're living in a fantasy world in which only Trump commits crimes and everybody else is fine. I will say this to wrap that up about John Friend's excellent editorial, which we probably should post online, and it will be posted so people can read it at www.barnesreview.com. Uh, he ends with saying that he hopes in 2020 that truth and justice finally will prevail once again. And making sure this happens really depends on whether or not people have a chance to read historical truth. Not this politically crap garbage you're seeing in leftist magazines or in the newspapers or on the news. Unfortunately, I don't really think, and I hate to be negative at the beginning of the year, I don't necessarily think truth and justice are going to win in 2020. I think we've got a long battle ahead of us, which is why magazines like the Barnes Review are so very important. So John says in 2020 and beyond, he's hoping that truth and justice will prevail in this country again. Look at the way things go, and I, I don't want to be negative, but I, I, we, we do have a long battle ahead of us here. I'm watching the news. And I do watch the news because I like to see what, as we always say, the media is the enemy, right? You know, I like to see what the enemy is saying. <laughs> and they are so diametrically opposed to one another uh, as far as what the truth is. How are you going to find the truth? Where are you going to find the truth? Well, most of what you see on the news anyway is per personal opinion. Um, and it's all agenda driven. So what we need is more magazines like the Barnes Review that are going to be willing to buck political correctness, tell the truth about situations like signs that go up that say it, it's okay to be white okay uh, i mean i wouldn't think we had to we would have to argue about whether it's okay to be white right i mean we're, we're supposed to be okay with any race you are these days and any religion you are but evidently i mean it's just the perfect case that we are being targeted so we've got to counter that and the way to counter that is with honest news which you can get from american free press newspaper at AmericanFreePress.net to check it out, and real, live, honest history. In your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine.
In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. Is it racist or to point out why black people are so mad at them and, and to, try to, to try to honestly and factually explain increases in attacks have been happening. And we can continue to move along like the mainstream news media does and just jump on the fantasy anti-Semitic bandwagon or racist bandwagon and pretend as if there aren't reasons why people get angry. So I think it's just important that we start this year off by saying anybody who's not subscribing to the Barnes Review ought to give it a shot so you actually see a, a, an opinion that hasn't been filtered through the uh, cookie, cutter, cookie cutter upper management of mainstream news ownership, you know. The cover article, the main article in the issue was by Thomas Goodrich, and it was on Buffalo Bill, the life and exploits of an American icon. On the cover, you know, it says Buffalo Bill was the real deal, and that's kind of the that's kind of what Goodrich is saying here. That despite all the the bragging and all of the legend, that uh, that underneath of that uh, was a real man who you know really did do at least some of and a lot of the things that he was reported to have done. Yeah, I mean, listen, as a kid growing up, we heard about Buffalo Bill, but mostly what we knew about Buffalo Bill was he had a big a Wild West show, right? Very few people know his background, that he was in the Wild West in the, the most dangerous of times, that he was an, an exceptional scout who had put himself in harm's way many, many times, who understood the American Indian, who understood wildlife and the plains and uh, the men in general. And so for all the claims about made about Buffalo Bill, there were very few that were actually false. He had done just about everything they said and more. And he, in the end, even though he was, uh, I think he was the, allegedly, no, I don't know if this one's true or not. Uh, a witness claimed it was that um, he was mad at a particular Indian who was wearing a white woman's um, scalp, I believe. And he killed that Indian eventually in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, if I'm, if I'm correct. And, uh, and, and and basically said he did it for Custer to avenge Custer because uh, I think they were appalled at the way the Indians had mutilated the bodies of uh, the vast majority of fallen soldiers who died at Little Bighorn. That being said, he also had a great respect for the Indians and wildlife in general, even though he killed lots and lots of buffaloes because he was hired to uh, provide buffalo meat, right, for uh, soldiers and workers, I guess, for the railroad, if that's correct. Uh, but yeah, he's an interesting guy from start to finish, and he lived a long life. And he also had a great respect for many of the other horse cultures of the world. His Wild West show, which I didn't know before Goodrich submitted this, because I really didn't know too much about Buffalo Bill. Uh, he had Mongolians, right? He had uh, uh, Ukrainian Cossacks. He had American Indians. He had South American cowboys. And he was really educating people about the other cultures of the world and uh, in a respectful fashion and, and and bringing them along with him on his shows. And I think people learned a lot about other cultures from Buffalo Bill's efforts. And although he, he I know he had married young, right? And he married Lulu was his wife, uh, Frederici, right? Her name was uh, Louisa Maud Frederici, Lulu. And he stayed with her. They had one little, one little time there, but he was uh, married to her for quite some time. And she was with him, I guess maybe in some respects, uh, he left to go out west and kind of left her as a, uh, now we'd call her a, what, a golf widow, but a, yeah, bit a buffalo yeah. widow, I suppose. And, you know, he, he became acquainted with Sitting Bull before Sitting Bull ended up getting killed, I think, right at one of the reservations. And he was familiar with many of the people. He was even right. Remember, he was an uh, icon of one of the Romanovs who came over here. Uh, we discussed this particular Romanov in a previous issue. It was the banished Romanov. You ought to check that issue out if you haven't. Go online and check out the Romanovs. 
And so he was a widely respected character. And I'm looking at these pictures of him. He's got to be in his 60s, right? And he's still riding around, maybe even 65. He's riding around. He's doing rough stuff. He was a great shooter. He involved women in his shows, specifically what Calamity Jane and Annie Oakley were there to show that women, too, were making great progress. He was like a, an emancipated man, we would call him, right? or liberated man, right? But anyway, yeah, that's a very interesting, highly illustrated article. And uh, I know you had um, uh, you particularly felt that uh, that article really uh, made sure that people knew that the legend of this man was really much, much, uh, much of it was fact and very little exaggeration. Right, because, you know, so many people just figured that Buffalo Bill and, and also, you know, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, you know, other men in history suffer from that same uh stigma if you will that that the legend uh was just a bunch of bs that you know that these were were ordinary men or maybe even you know uh napoleon type you know men and and referring to the napoleon complex but um you know so the legends were created to to kind of bolster their egos or or whatever but um you know in the case of all three of these men but especially buffalo bill you know, they, they really were uh, the stuff of legend. Yes. I mean, look, people people are, 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 um, discussed Buffalo Bill at the time in the same ways as Achilles and Hector. Okay, this is what one of the quotes said. Now, of course, he was much more real than those legends, although some of his exploits were uh, almost as amazing, you know. But, you know, this, this particular issue uh, was a lot of Americana, and this tied into a story, Buffalo Bill tied into a story that was written by uh, actually a Norwegian who has been in the United States for many, many years and served in the uh, U.S. military. So I think, Harold, uh, I think if I remember right, and this is based on a conversation that he had on my Dixie Heritage radio show a couple of years ago, I want to say he was maybe nine when he immigrated into the United States, and, and he's like in the 70s now so you know well he's and he's multi-talented I mean, he's a writer he's a broadcaster he's a photographer he has a blog um i have his blog here listed in one of his pedigrees because he had two stories so I'll, I'll get that to you when we discuss another story but this ties in okay so we also know that besides just generally buffalo bill one of the great american uh, legend legendary iconic images we have of the american west is the american cowboy and so our second story was by Harold Scharnhorst, and he uh, based his article on a book written by a guy named Andy Adams, who uh, wrote a book about a cowboy he knew named Tommy Moore and what the book was called The Log of the Cowboy. Now, Andy Adams himself was a cowboy for some time, I believe tra uh, 12 years, and he did a quite a bit of stuff. He was a great writer, Log of a Cowboy, a narrative of the old trail days. And so what he tells you is, you know, what we and the, this is kind of a, a crossover between a, a, a clarification of fact and myth. You know, we always see these uh, stories of uh, the, how many, how many uh, television programs did we have in the fifties and sixties that were um, based on cowboys in general or sheriffs and all this stuff. And so it's kind of kind of uh, romantic and. You know, uh, sleeping out of the stars and all this stuff. But life as a cowboy was tough. I mean, I don't think many people could do it today. You were in your saddle many, many hours during the day. Besides keeping a three-mile long trail of cattle in a line through uh, tough terrain, we'll say, uh, that was difficult enough with your buddies there. And being in that saddle all day long, you might get to have Indians pop up behind a hill and start shooting at you. You had a constant threat from rustlers. You better be able to handle a gun, not just uh, a lariat. And... Um, so it, 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 the, the dangers that they had during a, a, a day it, were more than we would go through in our entire lives. For instance, just crossing a stream with a herd of cattle could be extremely dangerous. One of them might go the wrong way. They're herd animals. They follow that one. There's a massive melee in the middle of the swollen river. Uh, the number of cowboys who died in and this and drowning, you know, you wouldn't expect that the uh, the majority of cowboys would die in drownings, but that's pretty much what what um, Andy Adams intimated here. And of course, we have the story along the way. Is we love to have some good flavor uh, and quotes from from people who actually saw things happening. There was one poor mom who had uh, lost two sons 
who were cowboys to uh, fording swollen streams and had drowned. And she left a note for her son and he had it in his pocket, I think, and, and it said, please be careful because, you know, your brother's died of drowning. And what happens, he goes across and there's a disaster and he ends up drowning and being his body being carried down four or five miles downstream. And I mean, it was a tragic thing. But besides doing that all day long, then you had to repair fences and you had to make sure that the they have cattle were being properly cared for, that they weren't stampeding. Stampedes were evidently a great concern, too. You're talking about thousands of cattle being being moved at a time. And uh, I don't know how many cowboys they might have trying to keep this huge number of cattle in line. But it was uh, it was a it was a big deal. And of course, this whole thing came up. We weren't the first. Americans weren't the first. The, the Spanish were. And before that was even the Spanish priests who found out that uh, I think they originally raised cattle in large numbers for the hides because the hides and other parts of the cattle, the hooves and such were extremely useful, but specifically the hides. And then they discovered that people were getting a flavor for beef. Back then, according to Harold, people were eating a lot of pork and a lot of chicken and people weren't eating too much beef. You know, cattle uh, were expensive to, to maintain. And uh, I don't know what the cost was. Uh, just a few years ago, it was well, still it took a lot of cents. land. You, you know, you could you could put a hundred hogs in a small barn, but you know, you it took a, depending on what part of the country you were in and how much grass you had and so forth. It could take anywhere from a half an acre to three or four acres of land per cow. Right, right. And you know, a um, lot of farmers didn't have that kind of real estate. Right, and so who were the first ones? Then that uh, unfortunately, once the taste for beef came up, then uh, the priests, the padres, were kind of pushed out of that business, and uh, the large, rich Spanish landowners came in. They are the founders of the famous haciendas, and the, the, the clothing that you see at the time was not a lie. These guys were so rich they were getting imported tapestries and uh, from Europe and silk from Asia for their wives and such. It was quite lucrative. In the end, and, I'm not, and I think people ought to read that story. I won't go into ultimate detail about that. In the end, um, the railroad pretty much put an end to that because you didn't have to drive your cattle. Uh, you still had to find a large amount of area to graze them on, but it was much easier for you to take uh, you know, to go from, say, uh, the, this American Southwest to the larger slaughterhouses in Chicago via train. And the other upside, of course, is your cattle aren't getting all sinewy and muscular and tough the meat getting tough as they're being driven all the way these 2,000 miles. They're being like pampered and taken all the way by train to the slaughterhouses. And thus the era of the cowboy pretty much ended with the expansion of the railways. Uh, very interesting little story. Um, and, you know, he, he, he there's a lot of stuff that Andy Adams includes in his books that you never think about. I mean, how hot it was out there and how the cattle themselves might be dehydrated. The constant search for water sources. And again, the uh, the threats and dangers that were that were encountered by a cowboy on a daily business. And I, I you know, it's funny. I thought it, 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 as an example, I thought these cowboys would have made a lot of money. But I'm not so sure they were making too much. I, I think he said, what was it, two or three bucks a day? About five dollars um, a day, he said some of them were making. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, mean, I, I always thought, well, that might, I wonder if they make as much money as, say, a, a kid on a lobstering island in Maine makes. Because uh, uh, up in Maine, there's little islands off the coast where there's just total lobstering, right? And I was surprised to find out that, that a, like a college kid or even a high school kid can work a summer on a lobster boat and make 70000 bucks. That's how valuable that is. But unfortunately, these <laughs> I think I'd rather throw out a lobster trap and pull in some lobsters than I would to be riding around the range and facing the dangers that these guys did. They were a special breed of person. Once again, a lot of myth, a lot of fact. Somewhere in between, we kind of try to find the truth about the American cowboy. And of course, this, as I said, this issue is a lot of American Americana, which is uh, something we like to, uh, people always ask for more, I should say, of Americana. We do focus heavily on World War II, so important. Uh, genocides, uh, who did it, who didn't, which ones are real, which ones aren't, et cetera, et cetera. This was a breath of fresh air. And you extra be all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. And if you're like me, you do not rely on the mainstream media to obtain this information because, frankly, you know that you just can't trust them. 
Fortunately, there is an alternative news outlet with a long-established track record for honesty and integrity, and that is the American Free Press. AFP is the preeminent alternative independent news source for honest, hard-working, truth-loving Americans. AFP is the antithesis of the controlled, lamestream media. AFP is employee-owned and has been so since its founding. Because of that, AFP never has and never will allow advertisers or special interests or big money to dictate what appears in the pages of the American Free Press newspaper. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. AFP covers the stories and tells the truth that the lamestream media is frankly scared to touch. And AFP offers real, on-the-scene reporting and commentary, the likes of which you will never see in the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or just about any other lamestream news source that you can think of. That's right. There's only one national populist news weekly staffed by an unsurpassed team of veteran investigative journalists who will dare to rip the veil off of many of the major news stories that are being censored and suppressed by the big-money-controlled media monopoly. And that's the American Free Press. AFP publishes exciting, in-depth, uncensored news and information that's grassroots and patriotic, information that Americans need to know in order to combat the growing police state. AFP stands firmly against the New World Order, and against those who are working to establish a global plantation under the rule of a powerful few. In short, AFP is your voice. If you have any doubt why they want to silence AFP, you must be relying on the lamestream media for your news. And folks, that's a big mistake. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. Extra, extra, be all about it. You had had a story yourself, several of them, and I thought this one you wrote called Baptist Bandits, the Christian side of the James Gang, and how Jesse Frank and Cole uh, younger, became preachers. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Jesse James's great-grandfather, grandfather, and father were all Baptist preachers. And Jesse was raised in church and had even surrendered to the ministry before the war between the states had begun. Of course, uh, shortly after that war begun, uh, Frank had already established himself as the uh, aid adjutant to uh, William Clark Quantrell, and so that put him on the Yankees, uh, you know, list of top people that they wanted to capture. So one day they came to the James farm, hoping that they would get uh, Jesse's family to tell them, you know, where uh, Frank was, and in finding Frank, they'd find Quantrell and the whole band of, of partisan rangers. And instead, uh, Dr. Samuels, who was Jesse's stepfather, uh, whether he did not know the information or was simply refusing to give it, don't know. But uh, they decided that since he wasn't forthcoming with the information, they were going to hang him in one of the barns. And Jesse walked in on that and uh, managed to shoot the Yankee that was attempting to hang his stepfather. Saved his stepfather's life, but by the time he was able to cut him down, there was significant brain damage and... Dr. Samuels was basically childlike in his mentality for the rest of his life. Uh, Jesse, after having done that, he runs into the house to tell his mama, and there's another Yankee soldier in there trying to rape his mama. So Jesse shoots that guy as well. And now he shot two Yankees, and, you know, his mama basically tells him, so you've got to get as far away from here as you can because, you know, they're going to come back because, you know, you've shot two of their guys. And so Jesse runs to the only place that he knows to run, and that's to his brother. And, of course, his brother is camped out with Quantrell and the Confederate Army. And so here Jesse James is now 13 years old, and he's in the Confederate Army. And he's riding with Quantrell and, and Bill Anderson. You know, these were guys who anybody who served under them at the end of the war were accused of, 
of some really serious war crimes. Most of them, if not any of them, were actually committed, but they were accused of them nonetheless. So they were not allowed to surrender. Basically a death sentence hanging over them for the rest of their lives if they were to be to be captured. What other occupation, if you will, could these men have have gone to other than something that was on, shall we say, the other side of the law? In Jesse and Frank's case, they were recruited by General Albert Pike, who was the president of the underground Confederate government. He was the leader of the Order of the Golden Circle at the time. And they were recruited. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that all of the James gang's exploits were actually military operations that were conducted under orders of an underground Confederate government. And they were basically appropriating monies and military supplies for what was going to be the second war for Southern independence. Of course, that war was never fought. And in the early 1900s, all of those cave-hidden caches of gold and guns were given to Pancho Villa uh, by what was left of the old Confederates to, uh, to finance Pancho Villa's Mexican Revolution. But during the course of his exploits, when Jesse was doing all of these things, not only were, were they not just common criminal enterprises, they were actual uh, targeted military operations. But in addition to that, Jesse actually pastored five churches while he was doing all of his outlaw business. You know, conventional historians do not deny that. They, they will try to claim that, well, you know, Jesse was a man who had to operate under many disguises and the preacher was just one that he was really good at because his dad had been, been a preacher and his grandfathers had been preachers. You know, my contention is his dad died when he was three years old and he probably never met his grandfathers. So my contention is, is that, you know, Jesse was raised in church. He was raised by a Christian mother. He, he did have some influence from his father when he was a, a small boy. My contention is that, that the preacher was not just one of Jesse's disguises, but that, that he was a genuine man of faith. And the reason that he, he went to the preacher so many times was because that's who he really was. And of course, the reason he pastored so many churches during his life in ministry, the reason he moved around in his ministry so much was because his outlaw uh, occupation with the James gang and also the fact that, you know, there was a there was a death sentence hanging over his head. He was just not the kind of person who could stay in one place very long. But, but every place where he was able to stay for at least a short period of time, you see him actively engaged in Christian ministry. Of course, Frank James also became an a itinerant evangelist at the end of his life, as did Cole Younger, who uh, Cole was actually in seminary when the war began, uh, was not able to finish his degree because the war broke out. And then Cole, uh, at the end of the war... Uh, you know, after he was um, incarcerated in the Stillwell, uh, Minnesota Penitentiary for uh, his involvement in the uh, bank robbery up in Minnesota. While he was in the penitentiary, he was completing his seminary degree. And when he was finally paroled and pardoned or whatever, um, he went into the ministry as a Baptist evangelist. And his two most famous sermons were The Evils of Drink and Crime Does Not Pay. <laughs> now, Frank James never did any time in jail. From no, the crimes. No, Frank. Uh, Frank was friends with the governor, as Jesse was friends with Governor Crittenden as well. Uh, it's believed, although uh, although the governor never admitted to that friendship with Jesse James, it, it's believed by some of us that Governor Crittenden actually helped Jesse fake his death, and that that solved the problem for both Jesse and for the governor. Frank, on the other hand, uh, the governor openly befriended him after Jesse's death even protected him from extradition orders from other states and basically arranged it so that he could stand trial for all of his crimes regardless of the state in Missouri. And of course, the courts in Missouri exonerated him on every charge either because the evidence wasn't there or it was an out-of-state charge that couldn't produce witnesses or, you know, whatever the reason. Yeah, Governor Crittenden pretty much personally either saw to it that Frank was acquitted for crimes in other states and or pardoned him for once he was convicted of in Missouri. Yeah, in the in the cowboy movies, or uh, you know, we see the, the Jesse James movies. Uh, we always see him dressed up as a regular old cowboy, him him and his guys. But 
I think you pointed out that to reiterate the point that these were military operations they put on their Confederate uniforms. Is that correct? Yes, sir, they did. And uh, they always wore their Confederate uniforms. And, and they also had another rule. And that was that they were not going, they, in other words, they followed the rules of warfare, so they would not fire on civilians, which is why this, the, the Missouri bank raid went, uh, not Missouri, the Minnesota bank raid went so poorly because when they went to a bank in the South, they knew there was a specific amount of Yankee money that was moving through that bank or a shipment of Yankee gold was moving through that bank on its way to the East or, or whatever. So what they would do is they would rob a predetermined amount of money and then they would leave the local people's deposits safely in the bank vault. And so, you know, the local people, even if they recognized the James gang and saw them robbing the bank, they didn't think anything of it. They were glad because, you know, they were glad to see the, the Yankee money getting stolen. And they knew that their deposits were going to be safe. But when they got to Minnesota, the locals did not recognize them and they thought it was a real bank robbery, and it was, but um, but they thought that it was a real bank robbery. And so the citizens of the town began shooting at them, and they did not shoot back. And that is why, for example, uh, two of the younger brothers took bullets in that in, in the getaway, and that's why they weren't able to get away. That's why they were captured. Be, um, but they refused to shoot back because they were not going to make war on, on civilians. Uh, it, was, it was a military operation. They followed the rules of war. And, and a lot of people don't realize that. Um, there were robberies attributed to the James gang where they were not in their Confederate uniforms or where civilians were shot and even murdered. But you have to understand that just because that robbery was attributed to the James gang does not mean that the James gang actually committed it. I mean, you, 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 you know how the government works. Um, you know, once once they've got a serial killer... Uh, they just start attributing everything to that person because it's easier than actually investigating and solving crimes. Richard Jewell, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, listen, then Cole Younger, I know he, he, he ended up um, doing time in prison, but he got out in 1901, just so people know where this period of time was, right? These bank robberies were, uh, what, uh, in the 1880s? Yeah, 1870s, 1880s, yes. Okay, and and so as soon as he was paroled, he became a Baptist preacher. So it was an all the, and by the way, Cole Younger was a relative, not just some guy that they recruited off the street. He was a cousin, correct? Yes. Very interesting stuff, and certainly sets the historical record straight on that. There was one other thing I wanted to discuss with you about that article. As I go along with these stories, I learned quite a bit myself when I'm looking for art. And here's this picture of Pancho Villa we're running. Well, the, the, the flip-flopping changes of fortunes in the Mexican Revolutionary period were fascinating. Uh, Pancho Villa is shown here next to uh, General John J. Blackjack Pershing, who was an ally at the time. And, of course, as we know in the end, uh, Villa must have uh, done some of the United States government didn't like, supported the wrong faction or whatever, because he was one time our ally. And then before you know it, uh, Pershing is going across the border to hunt down Pancho Villa. Well, we I were think it was told. General Patton who said that, because that, he had served with Pershing during that time. And later, in, I think it was in his memoirs, I think I remember him writing something to the effect that, that he didn't think that Pershing was ever really chasing Via, that he always knew where he was, he could have had him at any time, that there were times when Via may have even actually been uh, at Pershing's headquarters or in Pershing's tent, uh, visiting with him socially, but that the whole thing was really just an excuse for Pershing to train his army for, because he knew that the U.S. was going into World War I. Hello, I'm Tom Strain, Lieutenant Commander-in-Chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Confederate flag, Confederate symbols, and the reputation of our Confederate ancestors has come under attack. The Sons of Confederate Veterans is actively fending off our detractors, but there is only so much that we can do. We need your help. Contact your local, state, and national elected politicians and tell them that you will not tolerate these attacks on our heritage. You can also visit scv.org, download an application to join us in our fight to preserve our Southern heritage. Visit scb.org today. If you don't have a Confederate ancestor and you are tired of American history disappearing, you can assist us by becoming a friend of the SCB. Please visit scbheritagedefense.org 
and make a donation to the Heritage Defense Fund. We hope that you will join us in the fight to defend the Confederate soldier's good name. probably won't have time to discuss today, but we have discussed in previous issues of the Barnes Review is the um, is the whole Knights of the Golden Circle, the Order of the Golden Circle, and then the connection with General Albert Pike being a prominent Mason and this kind of being a, a Masonic organization, correct? Uh, I do know that people, people used to laugh at this whole thing about Jesse James. That he wasn't quite a Robin Hood, but he was not stealing for his own personal gain because obviously they never had super fancy houses or any of this other stuff, that he was, in fact, uh, stealing the money and hiding it for a possible future uh, revolution, as you said, the second uh, Confederate War for Independence. But we thought this was all a myth, too. And then you see these programs now about searching for Confederate gold, and they still find symbols cut and the hordes found in mason jars right underneath the cave floor and such. It's a fascinating story, the story of Jesse James and his family. And Pancho Villa, really, you know, the whole Mexican revolutionary period is, is a, is a you, you better be ready for a lot of different names and a lot of changing fortunes in that particular thing. But I particularly enjoyed that article. So thanks for writing that one and clearing that all up for us. And uh, again, there's a lot more in that article people will probably want to read that we haven't had a chance to discuss. And of course, this came on the heels of the uh, another. So I'll, I'll get to your other story later. But Mr. Sharnhorse wrote another story about the American history, and that's the vigilantes of Montana, uh, the old Montana when Montana was a territory. I found that very interesting, and in some respects, it's uh, tie into today and in the fact that back then. Citizens didn't have to just worry about Indians and bank robbers. They better worry about the sheriff that they have in town because some of these areas were pretty violent. And so uh, it turns out that many of the sheriffs who'd come into town might have their own checkered pasts. And maybe they were hired because they were quite good with a gun. Uh, you know, the legend of Wyatt Earp and, and the uh, OK Corral and uh, the Clantons, right, has also been kind of twisted about who was really at fault, what was going on, how honest were the Earps, and this type of stuff. So here we have a situation in old Montana where, and also there was the Idaho Territory in California when the gold rush came, and these uh, mining towns popped up. Now, we were talking about making money as a kid, as a lobsterman. Well, these miners, if you hit it, you'd hit it big sometimes, and you would go from dirt poor to super rich, but you better be able to get your gold somewhere. Because along the way, there was going to be either a highwayman or road agents or criminals or fellow miners or perhaps even the local sheriff who might want to make sure you didn't ever make it from your little mining town to the next biggest city, which I think was Virginia City. At the time, there was a bunch of cities that popped up in one particular gully or uh, valley in that particular area in old Montana. Well, it turned out that uh, uh, one of these uh, sheriffs was named uh, Henry Plummer. And so a guy wrote a book about that way back in the day. His name was Thomas Dimsdale. Dimsdale was an Englishman who was coming to the United States for his health, but he decided to go out west and he saw a lot of this happening. He wrote a, a, a really interesting book. And um, I'm trying to think of the name. He became the editor of the Montana Post, and I believe he was the first major newspaper editor out there. Uh, the name of the book. Let me see if I can dig that up. I think it was called, the, basically speaking, it was the Vigilantes of Montana, the, the hunting down and eventual uh, conviction of Henry Plummer, the corrupt sheriff. Well, it turned out Plummer was so corrupt, he had a whole network of road agents who were jumping miners, killing people for to st take their gold for the most part. And like people finally caught on to what was going on. And here's the statement for today is that, yeah, there's corruption in government and such. And it's always nice. Uh, I, we, of course, once again, we're not going to we're not going to advocate vigilantism today. But the fact of the matter is there comes a point when citizens need to stand up for themselves, when their government or when their local government or the sheriff or whatever has become extremely corrupt. And they did that. Inevitably, this group of vigilantes who were headed by pretty well-known members of the town, a uh, lawyer and maybe the mayor or something, and they started issuing warrants for the arrest of these people. In the end, they, they took Plummer, the um, uh, sheriff with the checkered past, and they hung him along with anybody else they could find who had been involved in the uh, uh, killing or thievery going on. I mean, these guys were out of control, and finally, average citizens had had enough. 
And of course, it wouldn't have happened had these poor average citizens been disarmed. Uh, now, our sheriffs here in Virginia, quite frankly, are an upstanding bunch of guys from what I've seen here. This is kind of a segue into what's going on in Virginia now about gun rights. I don't know if you were up on this, but... Well, I'm uh, our, reading that, was it like 53 counties or something like that were saying that they're going to become Second Amendment sanctuaries? Uh, we're up on that. We got over 100 counties, I think, here in Virginia. I think we're up to 95%. The only ones that are in Northern Virginia, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and one of the big horse horse counties here out in the middle isn't doing it because there's a bunch of rich people who live there. I live in a county, a rural county in Virginia. And when the minute we cross that county line, we go from trailer parks in my county to horse farms, a 500-acre horse farm. So they're not doing it. But anyway, here in Virginia, the sheriffs are all standing up. And you, as you well know, sheriffs are the uh, highest-ranking elected officials in the county. Uh uh, obviously, the governor is elected by the people of the county, and we have our county board or whatever that is, but the sheriffs is the big deal here. And if you see my sheriffs here and uh, the number of them that are standing up saying they are refusing, I should give you the, by the way, I'll finish that sentence. we got to go back and get in the back the back story. They're saying they're, they're going to turn these counties into to safe gun zones, and some of them are even starting their own militias. Uh, that being said, this is all spurred by uh, the changeover from a conservative to a liberal government here in Virginia. We now have this guy Northam, and we have a lieutenant governor uh, who are both super uh, weird, let's say that. Northam has somehow kept his job, even then, probably because he's a Democrat, because he appeared in his, no, oh, I don't remember what it was, his little law school yearbook or something dressed up in blackface which I don't think is nearly as offensive as it was considering the times these were taken. But his that lieutenant being said, governor has, has been caught having raped how many women, and oh, yet yes. he still holds yeah. his job. He's been accused of rape, so, but they've still got their jobs. Had they been <laughs> conservatives, I imagine they've been out of office by now. But anyway, this guy pops into office here in Virginia and says he's going to start confiscating guns and use the National Guard. Well, people here in Virginia aren't too happy about that. We got outside of those little, I will say, uh, poisoned areas of northern Virginia that come too close to the political center of Washington, D.C., uh, are average people. And they're Christian, church-going people. They hunt. Uh, they want their weapons for self-defense. Some of our rural counties, I got one high school in my county, and that, that sheriff has a lot of territory to cover. So if someone's going to, he says, if someone's going to break in your house, he can't get there in time. He is not going to take that away from people. Well, I've seen other counties. We're up to 90 or 95 percent have said that they're going to have sanctuary counties for guns. So even though this isn't really a vigilante movement, it is a movement of the people. And I will say that in this state, the town halls that have been held on banning guns have been overflowing with people uh, standing room only. But not only that hundreds and hundreds of people outside of these meeting halls and listen 95 to 99 percent of them are for gun rights here so yes people do make a difference your local sheriff is important yeah, and if you find out that he's corrupt or he, or he doesn't want to do his job well then you can at least challenge him legally in court these days um but it's a, it's an encouraging thing here um no it's not like the old west here uh, we, we're not going go to go to a bar and uh, two guys are going to get drunk and pull out guns and start shooting away at each other. I didn't like that. But they certainly want the right to defend themselves, and they certainly want the right to hunt. And well, I'm willing the, to, best, to guess it only happened that way in the B-Westerns. <laughs> well, and they were drinking Lord knows how much after a hard trail ride. I mean, I, I think if you went to war, being a cowboy might give you PTSD, too. Uh, that being said, it's in a very encouraging thing here. You know, the tie together was one uh, corrupt sheriffs versus good, honest, hardworking sheriffs. A lot of them here in Virginia were standing up for their people. Had this happened in old Montana and the sheriff had been legit, instead of uh, organizing an entire network of road agent highwaymen, uh, then he never would have gotten hung himself. Um, of course, in absentia recently, I think it was, of course it is because it was many years after his death, but they were had a hung jury on whether Plummer was guilty or innocent with the evidence they had. Well, at the time, those people knew exactly what was going on. I will say that the problem with vigilantism, of course, is they found these guys and hung them on the spot. There's a famous hanging tree in Montana, which at least 11 guys were hung. So I think a preacher chopped it down, right? He didn't want to see any more hangings there. But once in a while, without a trial, I mean, you did get the wrong guy. 
and their setups and their frame jobs and all that type of stuff. But for the most part, this was just a story of personal empowerment and people getting fed up. And yes, you can, if you can all get together and agree on it, uh, citizens still have a great influence on what's going to happen in their counties and in their local areas to fight corruption. So I, uh, I think, once again, that's a story with a lot more detail, a lot more interest than what we've been able to cover here. And we are out of time for this week's TBR History Hour, but we will be uh, back on the air again next week, same time, same place. And so come back next week, and Paul and I will finish this conversation. We got about halfway through our discussion of the January-February issue of TBR Magazine in today's broadcast, and we will finish the conversation next week. So be sure to come back. Until then, uh, thank you and God bless. See you next week.